faith can be. Uh, and at the same time, as we enter into this time of Good News 101, in which we want to make the faith as clear and as light as possible, as, as, I won't say simple, but as able to just be encapsulated in one sentence. I would say that that sentence is the very thing that our junior choir is about to proclaim to you in song. And so I invite them to come forward and proclaim the true good news of God, that Jesus loves you and me. Come on forward, ministers, and sing it for us.
Okay, let's start with salt. What do we know about salt? What color is it? Usually comes half. Great. Usually, we give it salt egg, right? But mostly we deal with it in little grains. What, what large body of water is salty? The ocean. The ocean, right? Yes. Very salty. Who's been to the beach? Who's had all that salt water to drink? It's a way of <laughs> You know, back in the day, people, well, let, let me tell you about people first. People are, if you look at me, okay, I am a slightly above average weight human being. And in my body, apparently, are over two cups of salt. Isn't that amazing? Two cups plus of salt. Yeah. And we know, if you know, if you studied your biology and done your work, you know that you can't live without salt. It powers a little bit. All the electrical things that make you move and think and be require salt to work. There are scientists here. I can make eye contact with them. I'd love to give you more details if you'd like to talk to her later. <laughs> Pastor Allison and one of her other lifetimes as a chemical engineer. Uh, now, we don't get much, we don't have much trouble getting salt in our everyday lives, do we? It's, it's not hard for us to come by. Usually, the opposite is true, right? Who of us have to eat salt-restricted diets? I mean, basically, pretty much all of us should probably watch it. Um, I know I should. But here's the deal. Back in the day, in the ancient world, really up until just a, a few centuries ago, I think, maybe even later than that, salt was harder to come by. People were actually paid in salt. It was a form of money. That's where the word salary comes from. Did you know that? It's related to saline. It's related to, to salt. In the same way, we have phrases in our language. The one that comes to mind for me is, worth your salt, worth one salt. She's worth her salt. He's worth his salt. What does that mean? Kind of good at what they do, right? Competent, able to do the job that they have. Right. So salt was also more than just a seasoning. Back in the day, it was a preservative. And many of us have lived in our lifetimes knowing that people preserve things with salt, right? It helped to keep things so they could last longer, make them cleaner, purer. It was a purifier especially a food purifier. Now, there were other ways to purify other things. Uh, if you wanted to purify water, for instance, that had oil on it, there was a way to do that. Uh, if you had a metal and you wanted to purify that metal, make it more pure of one kind of element versus another, this was how this was done. Uh, also, if you had a blade and you wanted to purify it before you cut something, what did you use? Fire. Fire, right? So, fire was another kind of purifier. Now, Jesus talks about both today, doesn't he, in this gospel story we get? He talks about salt, and he talks about fire. He says, everyone will be salted by fire. And by salted, in this case, his meaning will be purified by fire. So you see how that works? But hold on. Fire is meant to purify the metal. Jesus is talk about, talking about purifying people. What does that mean? Well, why don't you look at your scripture? It's playing right there in the text. He's talking about hell. That's the kind of fire that Jesus is talking about. Is that what he means right there in, in verse 49? Let's start there. Is that what he means? Is he talking about hell there? Because if Jesus does mean that, look at what it says, verse 49. Now everyone will be salted by fire. So if he's talking about hellfire there, then that means everyone, all of us, is going to experience it. 
Is he saying we're all going to hell? That doesn't sound right. So what does Jesus mean here and throughout this passage by the words we translate as hell and salt and fire? Well, let me think about this. People used to also use salt on wounds. Okay? Even today, in an emergency situation, a medic might still use a cloth soaked in salted water, saline solution, to clean a wound, an open wound. It does purify, but what does it do? It stains, right? You're going to hear in our anthem a little bit the word stain will come out. Now I can mix all these things together. So, it stings. It hurts like.
that you couldn't consume or use in other ways. Just talking to uh, to Clay, bring you out again, Clay. Sorry, he was talking about someone who brought a deer to him in the process, and uh, that you know, I asked him how much of that do you get as meat, and he said about uh, out of 100 and what pounds, 120 pounds, you, you could render about 80 pounds of meat. There's probably other uses for other pieces of that, but there are parts of that that ultimately you can't do much with, right? Well, they, now, the people of this time were very resourceful. They used almost everything, as did our ancestors, right? Our Pennsylvania Judge ancestors, almost nothing went to waste on an animal, right? But there were not only pieces that were left, there were certain things, according to the Bible law, you couldn't eat to consume, and they died too, right? And you may not be able to work with them, get into them, use them. So this was the place where you took those kind of dead things, especially as well as if they were rotten or impure for some reason, and they lost their ability to use. And you went to this valley of Gehenna, and they had this pit, this pit. And at the bottom of this pit, there was a fire going. And it was going, the city it was a municipal thing. The government kept that going 24-7 so that you could bring it whenever there'd be a fire there. And that fire is where you throw in all your yucky stuff, and it would get burned up. Consequently, everybody knew that Gehenna was the unquenchable fire. Get it? Okay. Now, what about this worm that never dies? Kind of a weird phrase, right? Well, that's been explained as, let's say, the little critters that eat up dead things. Do I need to say the name? Maybe I have your breakfast now. But, they would be all around the edges of this pit. And if your throne wasn't that great, and you missed the fire part, they could be there to finish the job for you. So that whatever went into this pit was fully, finally consumed. The whole point being, whatever you threw in there is going to be burned up, consumed, annihilated. And it was also important to note that this was only for dead parts and dead things. Not only was it immoral, but it was pretty much against the law to put anything living in there. All right? So think about this. Think about this particular image Jesus is using at this particular time in this particular place. All right? I'm not talking about other instances of when hell is talked about and translated by different words. In this particular case, Jesus is probably forming an image in people's minds. Think about the contrast that he's making. First, he talks about Listen to the things he, he compares. It would be better for you if you were a stumbling block for these little ones. It would be better for you if you tied a big stone around your neck, a millstone, and were thrown into the sea. Well, what would happen if that happened to you? Would you just sink to the bottom uh, and hang out down there for all eternity, suffering and struggling at the bottom of the sea? No. You would be dead pretty quick. So, he rolls right into the next example. And meant to be lying the same way. He says, the next thing he says is, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better to, you heard me emphasize this in the reading, it's better to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to Gehenna. That is, that fiery pit outside the town where they throw, what? Dead. So what he may be saying here is, it's better to live with a bad part of you taken off than to keep that part and be in, not necessarily the traditional hell we think of, but dead. Now I have a family member who has gone through cancer surgery and has had to have parts removed so that she can live, right? Totally different example, but back to the war again. If someone were injured and that injury wasn't treated for a while, gangrene might set in, right? So soldiers in the old days, that's how many times they lost arms and legs, hands and feet, because those parts were going really bad and would pollute the rest of the body. So. 
They had to have that cut off so they could live. Okay, so yes, this is all very gross. Uh, I understand that. But it's also to make a point that it is this way. Jesus is being shocking. To get their attention and ours. You see, this story picks up from where we left off last week. And if you were here, you remember that Jesus had just put a little child, probably a poor orphan, who was begging on the street, because that was most likely to be the only children out that time of day by themselves. He put this poor child in the midst of them last week, and he said, pay attention, everybody. Whoever welcomes uh, and takes care of a child like this welcomes me and the one who sent me. And then all of a sudden, we get the very beginning of this week, and it's why I read it, why I read it the way I did. All of a sudden, John interrupts this circle of very important teaching, and he changes the subject. He says, teacher, we saw someone cast out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Instead of paying attention to the big point that Jesus was making, John was whining about some other people, those folks over there, and about some minor issue. How many times do you think do, does the church get distracted by such little things? Things being done by other people and completely distracting us from the work at hand. The suffering even in our midst. Or, even more the case, a distraction that causes us to not pay attention to some part of us that needs to be dealt with, that is causing us to stumble. Yes, hard things to look at. Our own flaws. Our own weaknesses. Our own sins and our own selfishness. Let me make this clear. Jesus loves us. You've heard it. So wonderful. That is the gospel. And he has already saved us. He's already granted to us eternal life with him. And as St. Paul says in Romans, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 38 for my confirmation finishers who just had to study that and give it back to me. But while we are still in this life, walking this journey, he is still talking to us. He is still teaching us. And in this example today, he is still shocking us to let go of, to cut off, not literally cut off our hands, feet, and eyes, but Yes, to cut off the parts of us that make us fearful, hateful, jealous, unkind. He is telling us in his own tough words today that we have the power to change the ways in this world. To truly change really just one person. Who is that person? Not your pastor. Uh, <coughs> each of ourselves. That's what we really only have the power to change ourselves. Not save ourselves, but change our behaviors, our outlook, our way of approaching things. And if I don't think I have any ways that need changing, well then, I am like what Jesus said. I am salt that has lost its saltiness. How can that be? Well, because I am blind to the fact that I need to be salt and purified. Jesus believes I can do better. All of us can do better. We can help our neighbor better. We can welcome the little child better. Here at home and far away, Jesus believes we can cut out our fears and our failings, throw salt on our wounds and impurities, and let them be thrown, yes, into the fiery pit to be destroyed and forgotten forever. Jesus believes we can have salt, it says it right here, we can have salt in ourselves and be at peace with one another. He died, and it says in our scripture and in our Apostles' Creed, he descended to the dead. The other translation is, he descended into hell itself to make all that possible. So, 
In conclusion, when I started working on this gospel text and this sermon, I thought of a song that was taught to me by Shea Bouvier. That is Bo's significant other who lives in Canada and was visiting us for a couple weeks, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and so I asked Bo to sing the song for us and to kind of lead us. To feel free to sing along the chorus. Uh, we modified some of it, but I apologize in advance if the lyrics or the message might get a little Oh, please come forward. Now, what I, as he comes up and sets up for this, I invite you to follow the lyrics. They're on page 15. And feel free to sing on the chorus and the whole part, especially after you get the hang. Peace, 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 peace,
Peace of Christ be with you all. Please share some sign of that peace with one another. 